Welcome to the 13th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask all in the public gallery to turn off any electrical devices or turn them to silent so as not to interfere with the work of the committee. I have this morning apologies from committee members Colin Beatty and Kezia Dugdale. Um, the first item on the agenda is uh, for the committee to take item three in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, as part of our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance, we have today uh, the Right Honourable Greg Clark, Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and with him Jenny Bates, the Director of the EU Exit and Economic Partnership uh, from the UK Government. So welcome to both of you this morning. And uh, I understand, Minister or Secretary of State, that you have an opening statement to make, so I'll hand over to you at this point. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, and Ms Lindhurst, um, ladies and gentlemen, it is a, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for uh, inviting me to, to talk about the uh, industrial strategy uh, in particular. Uh, it's something uh, that for all of the, the discussions that we, we have, um, it seems to me that around the world uh, we uh, can look at a time of very exciting opportunity for all parts of the United Kingdom. Um, around the, the world, industries are being transformed by new uh, technologies, uh, the way that we work, the way that we live, the way that we consume products and services uh, is changing. And it so happens uh, that the UK, and in uh, many particular respects uh, Scotland, uh, is uniquely well-placed uh, to benefit from that. Uh, if we think uh, of breakthroughs in medicine, uh, if we think uh, of the, the revolution uh, in clean energy that's taking place uh, around the world, uh, if we uh, look at the, uh, the insights uh, that come uh, from uh, advanced manufacturing and the transition to how we get about, these are areas uh, of great strengths. And so the approach that we've taken in the industrial strategy is to, to plan ahead deliberately for the future. Um, now, obviously, this uh, has to be uh, a collaborative uh, effort. If you were to have a strategy, it has to be for the long term. Short term strategy is a contradiction in terms. And the best way to root a strategy in the long term uh, is to make it uh, very collaborative, to distill the wisdom uh, of people in the economy, whether they are uh, entrepreneurs, whether they are people that run companies, whether they are uh, employees, trade unions, whether they're scientists and uh, people that run universities, uh, training uh, institutions, uh, and of course uh, the leaders uh, of our economy, whether it's in the nations uh, or whether it's in uh, our cities. That's the approach that we've taken. I've been very grateful uh, for what has been a tremendous response to the consultation uh, right across uh, the UK, but with a particular uh, interest in Scotland. Uh, what we have published, and I think members have seen before and have a copy of the, uh, the white paper, uh, is very much a distillation uh, of that, uh, of the collective wisdom uh, that came in the responses to the consultation. Uh, we'll, I'm sure, go into it in more detail, but it sets out uh, four grand challenges uh, in which we think we need to give a particular uh, push and impetus to make sure that we reap all of the, the benefits uh, of the future technological revolutions, uh, but also to, as any good strategy must, to identify uh, areas uh, of historic underperformance. And it's well known that uh, across the economy, uh, the, the levels of productivity compared to some of our competitors uh, are not what they uh, can be. Um, and the more productive we are, uh, the more prosperous we can be, and the better off our citizens uh, can be. So it addresses uh, some of the, the principal uh, drivers uh, of productivity. Uh, in this, we've had, uh, I think, a good uh, cooperation uh, with, the, uh, with the Scottish Government. It's obviously very important that many of the, uh, the responsibilities are devolved, uh, and where we can, uh, to, where we can join forces, uh, that obviously uh, helps. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the four eyes uh, approach uh, has been something that's been contributed to the consideration of the strategy and the, uh, and the attention to investment, to innovation, uh, to I know what is termed by the government here inclusive growth and to internationalism. These are strong themes of the industrial strategy and I hope that as we implement it, uh, then this can be an area of uh, shared prosperity. 
Thank you very much. And it may be too early to say, but are there specific examples of where the industrial strategy has started to work thus far? Yes, I think there are. Let me give um, uh, two examples uh, in particular. Uh, we know that uh, in, uh, in the automotive sector, uh, for example, the, this is a, a time of particular change. Um, and if, I, if we think just about how vehicles of the future, but we're talking about the, 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 the near future, and indeed the present in many cases, uh, how they're powered, there is going to be a big move towards uh, powering by electricity. Uh, we know also that in the global drive towards clean energy, uh, we uh, are making great strides, um, and uh, Scotland obviously makes a major contribution uh, to renewable energy. Now, that provides a strategic opportunity to bring these together, because one of the features, as everyone knows, of renewable energy uh, is that it is uh, intermittent. Uh, and so the extent to which you can store energy that is generated um, when it is abundant and to be used uh, when it's needed, uh, the, the more successful your deployment can be and the more you can bring costs down. So through the uh, industrial strategy, through the focus on clean growth uh, and uh, on the future of mobility, we've made a big uh, investment, a commitment of a quarter of a billion pounds uh, called the Faraday Challenge uh, to be the place in the world that not only develops the next generation of battery technology, but manufactures it. This has already attracted a huge amount of interest. There is co-investment uh, from, uh, from across both the, uh, the automotive and in the energy sectors. And I think it's a good example of how setting out uh, what I think is a consensus and shared long-term ambition can give investors the confidence to invest now uh, so that you can actually safeguard and in many cases create jobs uh, in the present through setting out a clear vision for the future and um, in both of those uh, sectors the Faraday challenge uh, is increasingly recognized uh, as being uh, an initiative that is commanding respect around the world. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now turn to questions from Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, to start off, what does the UK government see as the key risks and opportunities for the UK and Scotland over the next 10 years? Well, I think the, the, the opportunities to, uh, to start with them uh, first um, come from building on the strengths that we have uh, and looking at whether those strengths uh, are going to be in demand uh, in the future, not just domestically, but around the world. And I think what you see uh, in Scotland in particular, but it applies to, to the UK, uh, is that some of the, you know, the particular strengths that we have uh, and that uh, are felt here, we know are going to be in great demand. So science, uh, for example, um, it, it hardly uh, bears... Uh, emphasis that this is a nation of science. We, uh, some of the biggest breakthroughs in the world have come from uh, brilliant researchers uh, and scientists uh, here. Uh, if we take artificial intelligence that's transforming uh, industries uh, all across the world, then uh, here in Scotland, some of the earliest breakthroughs uh, in AI uh, were made. Uh, we can apply that, I mentioned uh, in response to the convener's uh, uh, initial uh, question, uh, mentioned renewable energy. Uh, here again, uh, we have uh, established, we have a long established uh, set of strengths. When it comes to renewable energy, of course, a lot of that is about marine engineering, uh, which draws on the strengths uh, of, uh, of the present and the past, whether that is in the uh, offshore sector uh, or whether it's uh, in, uh, in shipbuilding and the, the skills and the, uh, and the research ingenuity that comes from that. So uh, I think it is uh, looking to what we have uh, that is strong, but making sure we invest in them for the future. Uh, investment both in further innovation, but also to make sure that the workforce uh, has the skills to be able to, uh, uh, to implement the opportunities uh, that are there. Uh, and also to make sure that we uh, internationally uh, exploit those particular advantages. I think we are very well placed, um, both in Scotland and across the UK, uh, to do that. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the risk? What is the, uh, the, the challenge? 
Well, I would say this. In, in preparing the industrial strategy, and I dare say uh, you as a committee, when you've taken evidence and when you've travelled uh, overseas, you will have discovered that countries all around the world uh, are, uh, are coming to uh, a, an equivalent realisation that the world is changing very rapidly. Uh, they areas that we are strong in and that Scotland is, is strong in uh, are being noticed uh, and there is a big effort to, uh, to emulate uh, and to catch up uh, in some cases. So we can't, uh, we can't take anything for granted, we can't be complacent, we have to have, it seems to me, a long-term and deliberate programme to uh, increase and improve our investment uh, in research, in science and innovation, that we need to uh, train uh, the workforce so that they've got those skills of the future. I think we need to be active uh, in promoting our products and services uh, around the world. I think we need to invest in our uh, infrastructure. And I think we need to uh, also make sure that we uh, retain the strengths uh, of being a business environment in which it is possible for, for new entrepreneurs to establish businesses uh, and to see them grow. One of the key issues uh, and areas that you spoke about earlier was energy. Um, I was wanting to ask you, the UK depends on Europe for 44% of its gas supplies and 6% of its electricity needs, and then that's set to double by 2023 and double again by 2030. So will the UK remain a member of the EU internal energy market after Brexit? Well, these are part of the, the discussions um, that are going on as part of the... Uh, the, the Brexit uh, negotiations. What, uh, what I've said on, uh, uh, on energy is that I think it's been a, a positive source uh, of, uh, of resilience and, um, and diversity in our system that we have, for example, uh, important interconnectors uh, with the, the rest of the European Union. Um, it's, if you look uh, at, uh, in, the, uh, in the context of the UK, uh, for example, our biggest current uh, energy infrastructure investment, the, the Hinkley Point C nuclear power station that is being built, uh, as you know, by uh, uh, EDF, uh, a French uh, company. A lot of our uh, cooperation uh, crosses borders. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, my uh, expectation uh, and uh, my ambition is that we'll be able to uh, make an agreement to be able to continue uh, the, uh, the effective uh, cooperation that we, we have uh, at European level. But clearly that's got further to go. Post the March Council, now is the time uh, when the, that future relationship uh, is being uh, discussed. And in terms of that future relationship, um, does that include free movement of people? Because um, the House of Commons report on energy security, and, sorry, House of Lords report, energy security report published in January said that um, in reference to Hinkley Point C that you already talked about, that the energy industry is reliant on workers from the EU in particular to fill its engineering roles. Uh, dependence on EU workers is particularly acute in the nuclear energy sector. Difficult to complete construction of new nuclear power facility at Hinkley Point. Well, so uh, the question of, um, uh, of our future... Uh, migration policy once we have the, uh, the, the ability to, to set that uh, domestically is obviously uh, a big issue that I'm sure the, the committee will want to take uh, evidence on separately and of course um, that is uh, an important part uh, of our future relationship. It has always been uh, clear post the referendum that we should be in control of that. But I think uh, it's an important uh, to, to emphasise that uh, in my view no part of the results uh, of the, the referendum was to say that we should not have uh, talented uh, people, engineers in the, in the case that you mentioned, uh, able to come and work uh, in the UK. Uh, in fact, quite the, the reverse. If we want to be uh, even more successful, uh, the future is to be, uh, to be exporting uh, internationally, to have close relationships uh, internationally, and as in the case uh, of nuclear power, of course that will uh, involve people uh, coming to work here just as uh, UK citizens uh, work in other countries, and that is a very important part of it. And all of the, the debates around the referendum, I never encountered any view that we should uh, be, uh, be against 
talented people, take uh, our scientists, uh, for example, that we should have, uh, we should have fewer, uh, if I can put it this way, scientists uh, working uh, together. Quite the reverse. In fact, the industrial strategy makes a commitment to expand uh, the number of uh, places available uh, for overseas researchers in UK universities. So that, uh, that is clearly uh, understood. In the case of the, uh, the project that you mentioned, and actually it has some parallels in other areas uh, as well. I think it's fair to say that um, because it's been a long time, there's been a long pause, uh, if I can put it that way, uh, in, the, the, in the implementation of a civil nuclear program here. It was, uh, I think, um, uh, Sizewell, which was the, the last uh, new nuclear power station. Uh, of course, a lot of the skills that we used to have uh, in that industry, a lot of people have retired from it. So we have to, to some extent, uh, reboot uh, the, the skills that we have in these industries. And again, part of the industrial strategy, part of taking a long-term uh, approach is where you see areas uh, of increasing focus, and energy is one. That, that as well as making those investments, you also think about the supply of skills. Uh, so there are uh, the, the National Nuclear College, uh, for example, has been established so that we can grow those skills uh, domestically uh, as well as having that cooperation. Um, if, if we aren't a member of the EU internal market, what impact will that have on consumers? I mean, we already have four million households in the UK in poverty. And the same report by the House of Lords says it is likely that the UK's withdrawal from the EU will lead to less efficient energy trade, which could in turn increase the price paid by consumers for energy security. So if the House of Lords is flagging up this is a, a potential problem, we already have four million households in the UK in fuel poverty. What steps will UK government take to protect households from price increases as a result of Brexit and stop more families falling into poverty? Well, two things I'd say, uh, Ms. MacDonald. The first uh, is that, um, uh, uh, as I said in reply to your earlier question, my uh, aspiration and uh, an expectation is that we will be able to achieve a good agreement uh, in energy. It's one of these areas in which it is so evidently uh, in our joint interest. It's an area in which uh, a lot of the discussions uh, operate on a, on a technical uh, level between uh, specialists between uh, engineers who have a long track record uh, of working very well together uh, and the discussions uh, that we, we've been having uh, have been very positive there. So, uh, so I, my expectation is that we will be able to continue to, uh, to regard energy as an area of good cooperation. Um, but we have a responsibility, uh, of course, domestically to, to look to the future and to make sure that we have uh, energy supplies that will meet the, uh, the demands of the, the population and the economy. Uh, it's one of the reasons uh, why we uh, have uh, favoured a diversity uh, of energy uh, sources. I think that's important. Uh, and the committee may, may know and may be interested to hear from Professor Dieter Helm, the great uh, authority uh, on energy, who, at my request, has uh, made a very comprehensive review of the future costs of energy to make sure that we, uh, we bear down uh, on the costs that uh, consumers pay, whether they are households or whether they're industrial users. Um, you know, you've talked about uh, having more uh, domestic energy supply, and one of those dependent areas is nuclear power, 21% from electricity. Well, will the UK remember a member of Euratom after Brexit? Uh, no, there's uh, one of the, uh, the consequences uh, of leaving the European Union uh, is that we, uh, we have to leave Euratom. That was um, something that was, uh, was established. Um, but what we said at the time um, was that the, the cooperation we've had uh, with Euratom uh, over the years has been uh, very successful. So we want to see uh, a, uh, th that relationship um, uh, in terms of its substance, uh, be able to continue. Uh, and there are very positive and fruitful discussions that have taken place uh, with uh, Euratom and, uh, and with uh, part of the negotiations to see how we can do that. But obviously, they haven't been concluded yet. Yeah. Can I, I just think, finish my last point? Well, just one if second. you could, and then we'll move on to questions right, okay. from other committee members. Right. The, 
Again, the same House of Lords report states, if the government does not replicate the provisions of Eurotom by the date of departure, the UK will be unable to trade in nuclear goods and services. Has the UK government got the timetable in place in order to replicate the provisions of Eurotom in time to avert this? Yes, so there, there is a nuclear safeguards bill that uh, is, has passed through the House of Commons, is now in the, in the House of Lords, uh, and for precisely that purpose, it's, it's obviously uh, necessary to be, to be well prepared, um, and so those arrangements uh, have been put in place, and that bill has, was introduced uh, many months ago. Thanks so much. Um, thanks. Gillian Martin. Yes, I have a, a follow-up question in terms of opportunities. Now, obviously, we've just had the agenda pay cap reporting and um, uh, the companies have been releasing their, their, their figures on that. We did an inquiry on that last year um, around the agenda pay gap. And one of the things when we were looking at that uh, strategy that, or that... Um, <sighs> we thought that, although it's well-meaning, didn't have any action plan associated with it. There was not an action plan um, put in place. Um, we were not asking for action plans to be put in place by the companies who reported. But I want to know, as a result of the figures that are coming out, and some of them have been quite stark, what you're going to do in terms of actually um, unleashing the productivity that could be unleashed by closing the gender pay gap, what you're going to take for that uh, in the future in terms of policy to actually make this a meaningful exercise I completely agree with you that you should see it in the, the context of productivity. Uh, when you are failing to make use uh, of the, uh, the full contribution um, that women can make uh, to our economy and, and to our society, this is not just a, an injustice, which it is, uh, it is also uh, a missed uh, opportunity. And that's one of the reasons um, that this, uh, this requirement to disclose the, uh, the gender pay gap was made. Uh, now, I think, you know, sometimes... Um, we say that, that transparency uh, is, uh, has consequences and can achieve a, uh, a momentum, and I think this is a very good uh, piece of evidence uh, in favour of that proposition. It's not the, the end of the, the road, but what you've seen just in recent weeks, and it is just weeks, um, in fact days, uh, since the, uh, the deadline uh, was there, I think there has been uh, a degree of... Uh, uh, varying from surprise to outrage at some of the differences uh, that have been uh, in display, and you've already seen, and you've already seen, well, you've already seen companies, uh, including some uh, uh, some public sector uh, employers, uh, changing the uh, the salaries, increasing the salaries uh, of women, uh, equalising the salaries that are paid uh, for people uh, doing in in effect uh, the same job. So you're already seeing that. Uh, from that disclosure. Uh, now, part of the corporate governance uh, reforms that we uh, have set in place uh, is that there is now uh, a responsibility on boards to set out uh, how they are addressing the interests uh, of uh, a range of stakeholders, but including uh, the workforce. The gender pay gap uh, is a very important part of that. So not only do they have to uh, disclose, but they have to set out uh, what actions are being taken. One of the other reforms that we're making uh, is to ensure that uh, companies have a, uh, a representative uh, on the board uh, who uh, takes, uh, who speaks for the workforce. Now, whether that is a, uh, a, a, a director appointed from the workforce, or whether it's one of the non-executive. Uh, directors that has that responsibility, or whether it's a an employee council that uh, uh, that advises. So these are actions that are already uh, taking place. Uh, but the import of your question, we wouldn't have required this disclosure uh, if there wasn't a recognition that we want that gap to be closed. Uh, we've taken uh, a set of actions of which the first has been evidently galvanising. Uh, and you know, my uh, commitment to this and my colleagues across government uh, is to, uh, to do uh, what is needed to make sure that we achieve the justice and the, uh, the full productive potential uh, that lies behind uh, the, the disparities that are there at the, the moment. But the other criticisms are that the ceiling is, is too high, 250. Um, that misses out an awful lot of companies in Scotland, for example. We are an SME-run economy, and most of our uh, businesses are 
100 employees or less. Do you think that having looked at it now, that it could be looked at again in terms of the companies that have to have a duty to report or actually bring, bring that down as they have in other countries? Well, I think it's the right start. It has uh, included uh, many companies. In fact, some of the, the original suggestions were that it would just be uh, listed companies and you know, companies quoted on the stock exchange. So we took a view, um, my colleagues took a view, that we should expand it beyond just a minimal uh, requirement, and I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, I think the, it's still literally very early days, but I, uh, there will be, uh, as there is, intense interest in what this is disclosing. Uh, and I'm sure this committee, um, your equivalent committee in the, uh, in the UK Parliament, uh, will uh, very closely scrutinise that and advise uh, whether uh, this model can usefully be extended. Thank you. And Dean Lockhart. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener, and good, good morning, Secretary of State. Uh, I'd like to move uh, back to the industrial strategy and uh, how it will work in practice and apply to Scotland. Um, first of all, in relation to exports, um, I was on a, a trade mission to China with Scottish uh, businesses uh, earlier this week, and uh, as you well know, that represents a massive opportunity for e exporting companies from, from the UK. In Scotland, um, only... 50 companies or 60 companies represent half of our exports, so there's a significant opportunity for us to uh, expand our export base. The industrial strategy, one of the objectives, is to encourage companies to access international markets. There is also a new export strategy being uh, consulted upon. So I wonder if you could uh, talk us through how both those strategies will work together to encourage companies across the U UK to, to increase exports. Absolutely. Perhaps I'll start then. Perhaps um, uh, Jenny Bates may uh, want to uh, fresh it out. But you're absolutely right. So throughout the industrial strategy, there is a clear orientation uh, to, uh, to be more international. Um, the opportunities uh, in most of the technologies that I've talked about are not just confined to the UK, but they are firmly uh, international. Uh, and uh, as uh, Mr MacDonald was um, uh, asking about in terms of risks, the, the risks are that if you don't internationalise, then actually other uh, companies in other countries uh, will uh, come in a competitive way into your market. So it's an imperative as well as uh, an, an opportunity. Uh, the creation of the Department of International Trade uh, is something that gives you know, particular uh, prominence uh, to that. When, uh, uh, when we finish our discussions here, I'm... Um, uh, going to an event in which uh, one of the international trade ministers uh, will be speaking, emphasising the, the opportunities that are there. Uh, I think there are a number of different ways in which that can be uh, done. I think in posts overseas, you're raising the, the profile uh, of the industries and the sectors uh, in which we are strong is very important. The industrial strategy uh, has become quite a calling card, we found. We've, we've had to translate it into an increasing number of languages because in posts around the world, uh, they are asking for it to be available because, as I uh, said to Mr. MacDonald, a lot of uh, investment and trading relationships are decided not just on a kind of short-term calculation, but to know whether this country, this partner country, uh, is going in the right direction for the long term. Uh, so that's important. Uh, but your point, Ms. Lockhart, is, um, is absolutely right, that the, uh, we have uh, companies who are very well-versed in uh, exporting, and we have some who uh, perhaps haven't been uh, used to that. Uh, and just as small businesses sometimes need help and advice to, to grow into larger businesses, those that are dipping their toes into export markets for the first time can benefit, it seems to me, from active uh, government support. Uh, we are supplying that, and the, the strategy that you mentioned uh, is asking, particularly those companies, what, what do you need uh, from us to be able to, uh, to further your uh, efforts? Uh, it's very important, and, uh, and again, it's an area in which both the UK government, and obviously it's a, uh, uh, international trade is, uh, uh, is the competence of my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Fox, all of the different sectors in the economy and all of the different uh, places and you know, towns and cities have a lot to contribute to that. Uh, and so I think it's an area in which we should uh, work very closely together, um, and I hope we will. Jen, I don't know whether there's anything you wanted to add. Um, yeah, just a couple of points. I guess to say that we are, as, as the Department of 
business and energy industrial strategy, we're working very closely with our colleagues at the Department for International Trade. They are, of course, former colleagues of ours because they used to be part of the department and have moved out to be part of the new trade ministry. Um, we are focusing those discussions as we prepare the export strategy and do the development on it around the industrial strategy so that the approach to the export strategy is grounded in the industrial strategy and that they're not seen as, uh, as separate, separate approaches. We are focusing very much on, in particular, engagement around SMEs and how we can make sure that the export strategy really delivers for SMEs uh, in the UK, in Scotland and, and across the UK. And we're working particularly to identify where we think both the sort of growth opportunities are, the sort of traditional analysis around growth markets and where those, where those opportunities are, but also what the barriers are to UK businesses operating overseas and how we can use that export strategy to address those barriers. So it's obviously a strategy that's in development at the moment, but it is one that we are working very collaboratively with the Department for International Trade on. Thanks, Thanks very much. I mean, what struck me... Uh, from my visit is is the old model of exporting through distribution channels is is kind of no longer that important it's it's all about e-commerce or e-commerce is becoming so much more important uh, perhaps can you talk me through or talk us through some of the uh, initiatives under the industrial strategy that will help support the development of, of e-commerce across across the uk um, yeah, so I think, I mean, one of the things that we're doing, I mean, as part of the industrial strategy and, and the export strategy, as you say, is looking at how the nature of business is changing. And in the work around the barriers to trade, as um, really the, the, the world has moved on significantly from, the, as you say, the sort of traditional barriers, the tariff barriers. It's much more in, in what people describe as the non-tariff barrier space, which is really often the regulatory structure of other countries and how you can... Um, uh, come up with approaches that enable business to, to export. There is a strand of that that we're working with on the Department for International Trade around um, digital trade, uh, and a lot of trade obviously is delivered in a digital way through, through e-commerce, um, and we're engaging with them around how we do that, both through the export strategy, but also in terms of our future trade policy, because some of this is about the promotion activity, but the other piece, of course, is the engagement we need to have with other countries about their regulatory framework frameworks and how we can develop approaches that enable um, digital businesses to um, engage in the future. There's also a piece that's around um, linked to that, obviously, um, intellectual property and the protection of intellectual property. So it's, it's sort of embedded across a number of the aspects of how we are engaging with the Department for International Trade on the export strategy. Um, and it's certainly embedded, uh, the approach to digital is embedded within, within those areas. Great. Can I perhaps move on to a question about commercialization of innovation? Uh, it, again, it's one of the key themes of, of the industrial strategy. And we've seen across the UK, I think, examples of innovation from universities and other areas uh, being bought by overseas companies or perhaps not making it to market because the support hasn't been in place for whatever reason. I think in particular innovation that requires long-term patient capital has uh, perhaps not been developed in the UK uh, as much as it may have. Uh, great news that the industrial strategy is, is uh, targeting this, uh, the £2.5 billion uh, investment fund uh, to be run by the British uh, Business Bank. I wonder if you could talk us through how um, Scottish companies and um, Scottish universities can access that and, and get the benefit uh, from that long-term patient capital that uh, many of these innovative uh, initiatives will, will require. Absolutely. So um, you... Uh, put your finger on a, a strength, but also uh, something that we've been less good at. So we've been, we, we are brilliant at coming up with new inventions and new ideas, um, and Scotland uh, and Scottish universities and scientists and uh, innovators prominent amongst that. But often we've let the, the commercialization and the manufacturing potential slip through our fingers uh, in a way that other countries uh, haven't. Uh, and so we've got, and the committee knows through the industrial strategy, we've got the, uh, the biggest increase in R&D uh, investment, £4.7 billion, pounds, biggest for, uh, for over 40 years. Uh, that is available for, for pure research, for, for discovery, but crucially it's available uh, for the D side of R&D, the, the development, the translation uh, into uh, the, uh, the, the manufacturing and commercial uh, processes. 
Part of that goes into something we call the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, which is uh, open to institutions, uh, research and academic institutions uh, in Scotland, as every other part of um, the United Kingdom, uh, to uh, Scottish businesses, uh, if, they, if they've got an idea that they need some help and support uh, in being able to, to translate, uh, that is very important. I think the committee is familiar with the catapults um, uh, that make a big contribution to that uh, translation. Uh, and as Mr. Lockhart says, the, uh, the, the new uh, injection of funds into the British Business Bank uh, is you know, a big attempt to, to try to bridge that uh, gap that has uh, often correctly been diagnosed to, to exist between the, uh, the, uh, the ideas uh, and their commercialization. Uh, and again, I think it's something that um, I, I know uh, uh, across Scotland, whether it's the, uh, uh, the national government or whether it's the, uh, the uh, local uh, administrations, there's a great interest in supporting that. And we'll now move back to Julian Martin for a, um, a further question in a slightly different area, I think. Uh, yeah, um, thank you. It's... It's great to hear you talk about internationalisation and opportunities around internationalisation and I particularly want to target my questions around one of Scotland's most important uh, sectors in terms of um, uh, trade acro across the world and that's the food and drink sector. Now, um, I have a couple of questions around, around this. Um, we have a number of products, obviously, that are protected geographical indicators, Arbor Smokies, Stormy Black Pudding, obviously Scotch Whiskey, particularly important. After, after Brexit, um, we have a situation where we haven't really been having any kind of um, feedback from the UK government about how that's going to be managed and if we're still going to have this protected geographical status for those, for those products. And it's causing considerable concern amongst those producers. Um, could, could you give us any, any kind of indication of what's going to happen with the, with the status of those products and how that's going to be protected? This is to, uh, to recognise exactly what you say, that the, the importance, the provenance um, of products uh, is uh, of vital importance. That's part of what consumers want to know. They want to know um, where these high quality products uh, come from. So it is uh, an area of, uh, of huge priority for us. It's my colleagues principally in, uh, in DEFRA, of course, that are uh, responsible for the negotiation uh, of that. And it's not at the point in, in the discussions uh, that that, uh, that we, haven't, we haven't ended those discussions yet, uh, but um, if if you were to uh, perhaps have the opportunity to talk to some of my colleagues in the uh, in the uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Department, you will see that that is uh, very uh, well recognised. I think there is a complete unity of view of what is behind your question uh, and a determination that we will be able not just to continue to uh, uh, to have. Uh, the right protected descriptions, but actually, uh, in response to Mr. Lockhart's uh, question, be even more successful in marketing them around the world. It's, it's I mean, you, you mentioned building on strengths, yep. and obviously food and drink in Scotland is a major strength, not just for Scotland, but for, for the UK in terms of the amount of, of money that com comes into the country as a result of, of the export of, of products, particularly whisky. Um, one of the things that I was quite surprised at, the one of the trade de deal negotiations that's actually happened recently, um, obviously to uh, you know, take advantage of, of as you, you called it, uh, internationally exploit, was uh, with Hong Kong. And food and drink did not feature in that. Um, so I'm, I'm, what, what are you doing to engage with food and drink producers and actually meet with them so that when these negotiations are happening, that food and drink is front and centre of, as you say, internationally in exploiting uh, what we have in this country? I think you will see um, food and drink uh, take a, a much higher prominence than it has had for, for many years now in terms of our industrial uh, competitiveness. Uh, it is, in my view, you know, food and drink is our biggest manufacturing uh, industry, uh, for example. Um, it, is, um, it is a sector uh, which historically people haven't really thought of it as being uh, one that is full of technological innovation, but it is from, you know, from the farm uh, to manufacturing uh, techniques uh, to uh, 
uh, to storage uh, and transport. It is one of the, the most innovative uh, sectors. Uh, so a couple of things. One is that we, uh, we formed a sector council uh, for the uh, food and drink uh, industry to be able to, uh, to bring together what um, uh, you will recognize is, is often quite a fragmented and diverse uh, set of, um, uh, of companies and sometimes individuals in that so that we can you know, mass the voices together to, to sing uh, more loudly, uh, if I can put it uh, that way. And what I uh, hope and expect to see from that uh, is a very significant sector deal. We've, uh, we've uh, with a number of different sectors, the automotive sector, the life sciences sector, the, uh, the, the government, um, uh, and the, has responded to proposals from sectors as to how we can work together, how they can be better organised. Fear, there is a fear amongst the agriculture sector um, that the, you mentioned the automotive sector is, as a, as a whole in the UK, is actually probably more of a priority for you and that the, the needs and wants of the agricultural sector might be, um, I suppose, bargained with as a result of maybe deals with the automotive sector. I mean, can you give it, I mean, one of the things that, uh, that I have been asked by NUFS Scotland is, is to ask you specifically is whether or not you're actually um, going to be meeting with NUFS to actually look at the issues that they have around future trade deals with regard to food and drink because they have been asking ever since the, the result of the referendum to have a meeting with doc, Dr Fox and he has not responded to any of their, their letters around this. So given that food and drink, as you say, is a, a major sector that, that should be involved in these trade deals, I mean, can, can a commitment be made to actually engage more with the, the Scottish agricultural sector on the, quite a lot of the, the issues that they have around this. Certainly, I mean, just a, a couple of points on that. The, the Scottish agricultural sector responded very well uh, to the, the consultation we had on the industrial strategy. In fact, um, at a, uh, a roundtable event uh, we had uh, in at the University of Edinburgh uh, during the consultation period, I think I'm right in thinking that um, uh, uh, NFU Scotland uh, was there and certainly they made uh, a substantial contribution to the uh, to the consultation, uh, so I very much uh, uh, see that as important. Already, uh, some of the early commitments we've made from the innovation funding have been into uh, agricultural uh, research uh, and its application. Uh, so this is by no means you know, automotive is very important. So is aerospace. Some of uh, so are some of the advanced manufacturing sectors. But food and drink, in my view, uh, is a sector that has not had the the prominence uh, that it uh, that it deserves, both in terms well, in, in terms of its current contribution to the economy, in terms of its potential, uh, and in terms of the you know, the, the uh, breathtaking transformations that technology uh, uh, allows uh, it to be part of. So, when through the uh, through the sector council and through uh, what I've encouraged to be a proposal uh, for a sector deal in food and drink, uh, I. I'm certain that um, NFU Scotland will be uh, prominent in that, and I will make sure that they are. There, there's also concerns about um, any deals done with the United States or with Australia, for example, Australia in terms of beef, uh, United States in terms of whiskey, that might mean that there's products coming into the UK that maybe don't have the same kind of food standards or provenance uh, rules around them, which actually might eat into the market that there is for homegrown products. I mean, what's your response to that? I think it's a very important uh, question. Obviously, that is some way down the, the, the road at the... Uh, uh, this, you're talking about free trade agreements that have not been drawn up yet, but of course, you know, one of the things that Michael Gove uh, has said you know, very clearly uh, is that the, the standards that we expect uh, in terms uh, of quality and animal welfare, uh, for example, uh, are, uh, are intrinsic to what the British consumer, but also what the you know, British... Uh, citizens uh, regard uh, as being uh, essential and so uh, that is already e even before we get into the the negotiation uh, of free trade agreements has already been flagged for the reasons that you say uh, as being a very important matter thing um that, that coming back to gi that's one of the areas that 
by the letter of the law in terms of the devolution settlement should be devolved to the Scottish, the Scottish government, but actually the UK government are wanting to hold on to that. Um, that I see that as being a, an issue here. I mean, why why is, is that not being uh, automatically brought back to the Scottish Parliament? Well, there's a wider discussion that is going on, um, as, um, uh, as members of the committee know, uh, about the, you know, the, the right uh, treatment um, uh, between... Uh, the, the respective governments um, uh, of powers that, uh, that will come back uh, once we leave the European Union. Uh, I think it's right that that is conducted through the, uh, through the negotiating teams that are uh, responsible for that rather than, uh, rather than me here. Industry of, of Scotland. Of course, and it's very important, it's um, as is the case, that, um, uh, that industries, different sectors, you know, set out you know, what they would like to see uh, future arrangements uh, as being, and that um, that is that is an important contribution to the discussions that are taking place. Okay, thank you, Paul Arthur. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Secretary of State and Ms. Bates. Um, I would like to pick up on a Dean Lockhart's line of questioning on the commercialisation of innovation. Um, you make reference, Secretary of State, in the foreword to the challenges we face with productivity. We have businesses, people and places whose level of productivity is well below what can be achieved. And indeed, the uh, strategy sets out its vision for the world's most innovative economy, but crucially also good jobs and greater earning power for all. Now, in evidence that this committee has taken over the course of this inquiry, we have learned that there is a barrier to businesses implementing innovations, and a key reason behind that is potentially the nature of the UK labour market, i.e. there is no incentive for businesses to adopt innovations. I would be keen to hear your response to that and what you think the role is between businesses, or the relationship rather is between businesses having showing a willingness to implement innovation and employment law. They're very important uh, connections. I'll ask uh, Jenny to, uh, to add her own perspective uh, in a second. Um, uh, and this is you know, the reason we've laid it out in the in the strategy in this way is that it is uh, it is a very important uh, challenge. It has different dimensions to it. So to give you uh, an example, um, there is a relationship between the level of technology that can be deployed and the skills that are available in the workplace uh, in the workforce. Uh, if you don't have people with the requisite skills, uh, then you can be constrained in the level of technology that you can deploy, uh, which then has implications for productivity. One of the things that we know uh, across the UK, and, uh, and Scotland is not uh, exempt uh, from this, uh, is that there are uh, skills shortages, particularly uh, in those technical engineering uh, disciplines. Um, we, we see this uh, right across the, uh, the country. One of the, and we're candid, the uh, strategy ought to be, uh, ought to be warts and all, as it were, it ought to kind of show where you need to uh, improve. Uh, I think the, collectively, the, uh, the, the profile and the availability of technical education has not been uh, as prestigious, shall we say, as it is in some other countries that are our competitors. So one of the ways in which we can deploy more technology and thereby be more productive is to make sure that we have uh, a more uh, uh, STEM literate workforce. So that is uh, an important contribution to it. Specifically to employment law, do yep. you think it in, the business has an incentive to adopt innovations when the national living wage is a pound less than the real living wage? Well, I think the the introduction of the, the national living wage, uh, again, has been a challenge, as, uh, as we know, and no doubt the committee has taken evidence uh, to some uh, employers, but it is, uh, I think, the right thing to do, and uh, in some uh, respects that does uh, require a greater investment in innovation so that people can be supported in their work uh, to become... Um, uh, to make use of, uh, of technology that's available. But to, to address specifically your point about employment law and employment regulation, uh, you're absolutely right to, uh, to raise it. Uh, we commissioned the, uh, the review called Good Work by uh, Matthew Taylor, uh, who runs the uh, Royal Society of Arts, for precisely this reason. Uh, one of the consequences of the new technology is that it will be different uh, challenges to the existing model of employment. 
Uh, and it seems to me it is better to try to anticipate what they are uh, and, to, uh, and to establish whether you need to adjust your uh, employment law to give the same uh, degree of protection that we've wanted to, uh, to provide workers with in the past, so access to sick pay, uh, for example. Uh, we know that flexibility uh, can be uh, to the advantage uh, of many people, but for some people uh, it can be uh, something that they don't uh, want. And so the Taylor Review, which is, uh, you know, is an excellent piece of work, uh, we have put it out for uh, its measures for, for consultation. But the fact that we are the first country in the world specifically to commission uh, an investigation as to how we need to change employment law and regulation to be able to uh, to make sure workers benefit from and are not are disadvantaged by new technology, uh, I think is part of the strategic approach. Do you know whether yeah. you want to? I think there's one other point that came up in the evidence gathering work we were doing around the industrial strategy, which is the difference between firms operating within the same sector and the same labour market framework. And there's been lots of work on this by the OECD and others, looking at laggard firms and leading firms, and the evidence that those individuals that work in product productivity leading firms are earn more than individuals working in the firms that are not applying that innovation and diffusion and they're operating in the same sector and within the same labour market framework and where I think that takes you is is some of the work in the industrial strategy to think about what it is that's going on within firms they're operating in the same environment but the ones that are higher productivity are paying their workers more and and, and there are others that aren't and something in that space also around um, the management practices the diffusion of ideas and technology doesn't seem to be happening as strongly in the UK economy as it was in the past and so part of the industrial strategy is also looking at how you can strengthen management capability and practices and ensure that the knowledge and ideas and the ability to transfer that technology is also in place. I, agree, but I, I believe what we're seeing is an acceleration of a trend that has been present since the early 1970s which is a hollowing out of middle skilled middle uh, income jobs and the reality is that those at the bottom end are going to require enhanced protections. Now my colleague Gillian Martin uh, has adumbrated some concerns about post-Brexit scenarios. And given that, and you made reference to Dr Fox earlier, who has described the working time directive as a burden, Boris Johnson has said that employment regulation is now back-breaking, including the of a working time directive, and Michael Gove is indeed reported as saying that the working time directive should be scrapped. Giving this bonfire of regulations that your colleagues, Secretary of State and the Cabinet, are calling for post-Brexit, what do you think this will do for workers' rights and what impact do you think that will have on productivity? We've been very clear, and the Prime Minister has been personally clear, that we want to maintain the, the high level uh, of workers' rights uh, that exist at the moment. In many respects, they, the, the rights that workers have here go beyond uh, what is available uh, in other EU countries. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the Matthew Taylor report and the recommendations that we're uh, consulting uh, on, these are all ways in which we want to strengthen the rights that um, uh, employees and workers uh, have uh, and to to, to be on the front foot in taking that initiative. It seems to me that the future uh, success of our economy in every part of the, the United Kingdom has to be uh, on it being a highly productive, uh, good place of high standards. That is, that is where the opportunities are uh, in the world. There is no, um, it, there's no interest uh, whatever uh, in looking to reduce standards, quite the reverse. I think our place uh, is uh, as a, a, a country in the world that is associated with high standards, high quality, uh, and to be a place of confidence in which people can not only invest, but can work and live. My final question is in regards to, we've looked at some of these um, high income sectors, but there are many sectors within the Scottish economy, such as in agriculture, fruit picking, meat processing, etc., which are highly dependent upon migrant labour. What impact on productivity is an immigration policy which sees um, the end of free movement going to have? Well, two things. The first is that in these relatively lower productivity uh, sectors, uh, that is... Uh, a, a challenge that we need to address as to whether they are inevitably uh, low productivity. And 
uh, we, we were talking about food and drink uh, earlier, and that is one such uh, sector. Uh, in my view, that there are, there are big opportunities to uh, increase the level of productivity and therefore the, the level of wages and salaries uh, in that sector. Hospitality uh, is another. And I think these are areas that have not been seen for, for many years as being you know, part of our industrial future in quite the, the same way as others. I regard them as very different, so there's a, uh, there's a uh, different to the past. So there's a, a very clear focus on that. Um, when it comes to the, uh, to the future migration policy, uh, I think, as you know, the, uh, the, the Home Secretary uh, has asked the, the Migration Advisory Committee to make an assessment of the needs of the economy, including uh, the, uh, the points that you make about different sectors and uh, in some cases, there are seasonal requirements that, that change. It's not just different sectors, it's different parts of the UK. Do you understand why there are calls and there's a need for power over migration to be devolved to this parliament? Well, I think one of the, the, the features that comes out very strongly uh, in the industrial strategy is to, to recognise the needs of different industries uh, and the different needs uh, of different places. Uh, and in its work, uh, the... You know, the Migration Advisory uh, Committee has, has a remit to uh, advise independently and objectively, and they will uh, publish, uh, I'm sure, their, their assessment uh, as to what that needs to be. But I think, I think it's right that they should do it, uh, and then, I dare say, this committee will want to, to look at its recommendations and see how they're translated into policy. Move on to John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Uh, if, if I'd be allowed to have a supplementary on something you said previously, which was uh, around energy storage, and you emphasised battery technology, which uh, th that was what you were stressing. I mean, we've looked at different forms of energy storage, which is obviously a challenge. We've got a little bit of pump storage in Scotland. There's the concept of the interconnector to Norway, and then we could kind of store when we've got extra uh, power there. And then the whole concept of hydrogen that that is a way of uh, storing energy and also can be used as a fuel. I mean, are you open to supporting all of these or are you, are you very focused on batteries? Uh, very much so. I mentioned batteries because it has a particular relevance to, uh, uh, to the automotive uh, sector, so there is a coming together there, but of course hydrogen does uh, as well, and that's uh, very important. Um, Scotland has a... Uh, a very long history of, um, of storage through uh, through pumped uh, storage through through hydro, uh, and that continues to to be important. Uh, we know that the more storage uh, you have, the more you can deploy renewables, the more resilient your system is, and the more you can bring prices down. So uh, so we're open uh, to that. The the reason for citing uh, battery storage in particular uh, is that because of its widespread uh, use in products uh, as well as the pure energy sector, we know that there is international interest in this. We know that we've got some of the, uh, the world-leading uh, innovators in this, and so we want to capitalise on that. Uh, but, um, Mr Mason, it, it, it is certainly not at the uh, exclusion uh, of other forms of storage. That's great. Thanks very much. Uh, however, my main area of questioning is about uh, regional inequalities, and I think that is recognised in the industrial strategy. And uh, again, there's the kind of European link, because I think Scotland, or certainly parts of Scotland, and I know Wales as well, has hugely benefited from uh, European structural funds. So c could you say a little bit about how you see that going forward? I think there's, there's talk of a shared prosperity fund, but I don't know how much detail we've got of that. And so there is a little bit of concern in Scotland, and I believe also in Wales, as to you know, how would that be shared out, how would it be targeted, eh, that so, kind of thing. It's a very important question, and, and, and to your point uh, about disparities, um, very clearly uh, throughout the industrial strategy is a recognition that the, uh, the challenges, some of the challenges that we have, we talked a lot about productivity uh, this morning, that then translates into uh, earnings uh, in many cases. Uh, often it's a problem, uh, it's a challenge of, of composition, uh, as well as level. In other words, you've got places that are, uh, and industries and companies, as Jenny was saying, uh, that are uh, some of the most productive and um, prosperous on the planet, uh, alongside some areas uh, and some uh, sectors uh, and some companies uh, that seem to be a long way uh, from that. So closing that gap uh, is very important, and the geographical aspect of that uh, is 
uh, is important. It's one of the reasons why, for example, the programme of city deals that I uh, initiated in my uh, previous role uh, as the, the Minister for Cities and then Communities uh, Secretary, I've always regarded uh, as important. Uh, structural funds have been important to that, uh, and through uh, the, the work that I've done uh, in, uh, in promoting local growth, they've made a, an important contribution to it. Obviously, when those funds, uh, through the, uh, the budget payments no longer needing to be made, come back to, to the UK, uh, we've made a commitment that there will be uh, a, uh, a replacement, the Shared Prosperity Fund. Uh, there, needs, there will be, and there, there obviously needs to be, uh, an agreement uh, between the devolved administrations uh, but also, given that they go to different parts of uh, England, for example, in different ways, there needs to be uh, an arrangement between the, the administrations uh, and then for us uh, in England uh, uh, at a more local level how they're used. Uh, that is, uh, is recognised, it's understood, it is one of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the main agenda items, I think, for, uh, for agreement uh, in the discussions that my, my colleagues uh, and yours uh, have. I, mean, I, I do accept that you, you can't go into all of that detail as to what's being negotiated, but I mean, I think the, the, the European structural funds have emphasised needs, so they've looked at if South Wales or if the Highlands of Scotland have had particular needs, and, you know, well, roads in the, in the Highlands, I think, have benefited from European money. So could you at least reassure us that it will be based on need, the allocation of the money, rather than, say, on population or on some other basis? Well, uh, again, the, these are discussions for, uh, for my colleagues uh, who, uh, who will discuss and negotiate with the, uh, their counterparts uh, in the Scottish Government as to what the, the basis uh, of these uh, allocations will be. But what I can say, and it's very evident in the industrial strategy, uh, is that we recognise as a matter of policy and indeed long-term strategy that we want and need to reduce the, the disparities uh, in economic performance uh, in between places in the, the United Kingdom. So uh, that, is, that is a recognition that is made you know, voluntarily um, uh, through the industrial strategy. It's informed, as I say, by evidence that's been given uh, from uh, Scotland, from Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, and across uh, England. Uh, so uh, so I think these, these discussions and these conversations uh, are from a starting point of a kind of shared uh, analysis that some uh, assistance in helping areas you know, live up to their uh, potential by investing, whether it's in infrastructure uh, or in skills or in other areas, uh, is very important. Mm. I, mean, I, I mean, on time scale, I know there's commitments in the kind of short term, but can, I mean, can you see anything longer term that are you hoping to kind of maintain that kind of funding at roughly the same level? Because I think, I mean, a long-term commitment is quite important. I've got a part of my constituents in the East End of Glasgow. Uh, we've got Clyde Gateway Urban Regeneration Company and things like decontaminating the land, which has been there for decades. You know, these are long-term commitments. And so a one or two year guarantee is not really enough. And I think we need to, um, I can see the, the benefits of having uh, a, an agreed approach uh, as early as possible so you can have that uh, certainty about future projects. Uh, it's quite right that uh, many of the most important uses of these uh, funds, consistent with a strategy that is explicitly long-term, should allow the confidence for long-term investors to see that they can, uh, they can go into an area uh, on the basis of confidence uh, that it's, if it's decontaminated land, that is going to be uh, addressed. Uh, I, if I may, uh, convener, uh, will go back to my colleagues uh, in the, the cabinet and, and give you as much of an update as I can on, the, uh, on where we've got to on the discussions and the prospective timetable on that, but I completely recognise the, uh, uh, the, the time limit, the need for timeliness on it. That's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very oh, much. Sorry. Yeah, no, carry on. I'll bring, ja I'll bring Jackie Bailey in uh, later. I just, I think she had one supplementary, but that can be dealt with after. Anyway. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Uh, welcome, uh, Secretary of State. Um, uh, in your industrial strategy, you talk about grand challenges, one of these being clean growth, and you've talked about the Faraday challenge and, and, and batteries. One of the strengths of the Scottish economy, obviously, is renewables. 
Um, and yet we have seven and a half gigawatts of onshore wind capacity in the planning pipeline without a viable route to market because of the decision the government's made on um, excluding onshore wind from contracts for difference. Uh, I think your minister, Claire Perry, made some indications at the end of last year that um, this might be under some reconsideration. Do you recognise that with onshore wind um, from your own government's figures being 50% cheaper than nuclear, it's a well-established technology and it also has multiplier um, effects that this should be revisited, particularly in the, in the context of Scottish renewables? Well, uh, renewables is a, is a big success story for, uh, for the whole of the UK, and Scotland um, uh, has a uh, particularly distinguished uh, contribution to that, and, uh, and a lot of jobs are being created uh, through the, the supply chain that's now being established, especially for, uh, for offshore wind. Uh, when it comes, th there are some choices that need to be made, and they need to be made strategically. We took a uh, strategic decision my, my predecessors in post uh, did uh, to, uh, to concentrate uh, the available funds uh, on offshore wind uh, for, uh, for two reasons. One is that you send a, a signal there that uh, investors can invest with confidence, uh, kind of as I was, we were discussing with uh, Mr. Mason, uh, over the long term, and this is going to be uh, a sustained commitment so that they can build uh, facilities. Uh, and that has been a success, and uh, all along the, uh, the, the, the coastline in Scotland and the, uh, and the rest of the UK, you have industrial facilities that have been uh, built because of that clear long-term uh, commitment. The other aspect was it, uh, of it was that it, it, there is a kind of miles on the clock uh, aspect of cost, that the more you do, the more costs come down, and that has been uh, very successful for the reasons uh, that you say. Uh, so I wouldn't want to move away from what has been a very successful approach that has uh, that brought costs down, created uh, jobs, given what the industry wanted, which is a long-term uh, confidence. I wouldn't want to change that uh, lightly. Uh, however, I would say two things. Uh, one is I had um, some very fruitful discussions um, about a year uh, or so uh, ago uh, with uh, Paul Wheelhouse. We met um, uh, uh, on the, uh, the Isle of Lewis and we were uh, talking about the remote islands uh, uh, possibilities there. And uh, we have, uh, as a result of the discussions uh, we had and the, uh, the remote islands communities from uh, across Scotland came to that, uh, and so we have applied for state aid clearance uh, for it to be possible to have uh, onshore wind on remote islands, which I think uh, uh, addresses the concern uh, that was felt there, that this was uh, an opportunity. Um, uh, so uh, we've also said that it's important that local consent uh, is uh, in place. Uh, so as we review our uh, energy policy, um, uh, and I mentioned the, the Dieter Helm review to which we'll uh, respond. Uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we look at the whole uh, range uh, of commitments we make, but I wouldn't want to uh, uh, mislead the, the committee into thinking that the, the approach that we've taken uh, by having real momentum on uh, offshore wind, I don't regard as uh, successful. I think it's very important that we don't uh, as it were, you know, destabilise that progress lightly. Yes, no, I mean, offshore wind is successful. I don't dis d dispute that. I think the, <clears throat> I mean, your minister, uh, Claire Perry, did, did, did say that um, she was currently looking at whether changes could be made to the Contracts for Difference system because she recognised that onshore wind is absolutely part of the future and there's a lot of projects with planning consent sitting in Scotland. The fact that you want to promote offshore wind doesn't necessarily, in my view, preclude opening up the contracts for difference for onshore um, as, as well. You said this was a strategic decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would suggest to you it's more to do with the Conservative Manifesto commitment not to have any more on onshore wind in England, which is strictly speaking a planning uh, matter. So can you give any reassurance to the onshore wind industry that the work it's done, the investments it's made, the planning consents that have been granted can yield Developments. Well, it was it was a strategic decision. It was a decision that actually, if you uh, really establish a very significant you know, pre-committed um, pot of money for offshore wind, then investors 
can build manufacturing facilities with confidence. And in, in response to earlier questions, we, we noted that sometimes we haven't been good at having the manufacturing facilities and the supply chain um, by not thinking, uh, not joining up parts of uh, policy, uh, the policy process. And I think it's the case that if you look at what's happened on offshore wind, it's a good example of the opposite. A decision was taken that there would be uh, a large uh, sum of money available for the long term, uh, and it's achieved jobs, it's achieved investment, not least in Scotland, uh, and uh, it's brought down prices. So it was uh, strategic. Uh, we commissioned this report from Dieter Helm, and I don't know whether the committee has ever taken evidence uh, from him, but he is, uh, you know, he is a, uh, a radical and authoritative thinker on energy uh, matters. Uh, he, he made some uh, suggestions uh, about uh, CFDs and, and how we approach it. So uh, Claire Perry, my uh, uh, my colleague, said quite rightly that we'll we'll consider uh, his recommendations. Uh, we uh, we've asked for uh, evidence, which I know uh, the operators uh, of onshore in Scotland have contributed to that. We'll review it uh, and we'll respond uh, in that way. So that is that's the right way to proceed. But I, as I say, I. I think it would be uh, it would be wrong to uh, to not to recognise the success of an approach uh, that has been taken, and it's been a success for Scotland uh, as well as the the rest of the UK. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on sector deals, what are the criteria that you use to determine which sectors of the economy uh, are eligible or or, or um, you wish to negotiate sector deals with? So we set out in the uh, industrial strategy, have we got the page numbers? Um, yeah, so pages 208 to 212 of the industrial strategy uh, set out uh, some of the, uh, the, the criteria, some of the, uh, the questions that need to be answered by a sector that is contemplating uh, a sector deal. It is for the sector uh, themselves. What we, in effect, did in the consultation of the industrial strategy, we said that given that uh, in the past uh, some sectors like aerospace uh, have benefited from, uh, from creating an established institution, uh, if you like, the Aerospace Technology uh, Institute has brought the industry, the big players, the supply chain uh, and governments uh, together uh, around a table. Should this be uh, available to other industries and sectors? The answer in the consultation uh, was a resounding yes. In the consultation, um, we uh, invited um, some sectors to, to come forward just to illustrate the potential of this. Uh, and so life sciences uh, is one, the creative industries uh, is another, the construction sector uh, is uh, a further one. Uh, but it is open to, uh, to any sector that feels that they can, uh, by organizing themselves, by coming together, uh, to, to do things in a shared way, whether that's research and development, whether it's um, uh, training of the workforce. Uh, if, they can, uh, if they are prepared to organize and want a relationship uh, with us, then we will consider uh, their proposals. Uh, there's been a great deal of interest. We set out some of the, uh, the criteria that we would look for uh, there, and there's a huge amount of interest. I mentioned food and drink and uh, hospitality as two areas that um, are... Uh, have responded very positively, uh, and I uh, expect that we will be able to uh, reach agreements with them. But they're always and everywhere initiated by the sectors themselves, they're not initiated by uh, central government. Yes, I understand that, and I've seen the questions that you refer to that in, uh, sectors have to, to address. I wasn't, yes. What I was asking, though, was the criteria that government uses mm -hmm. to determine whether it wishes to proceed with a sector deal or not. Are you essentially saying that those questions are the government's criteria, and if they are satisfactorily addressed, you will look favourably on a sector deal? Yes. Okay. Right. And these sector deals will be UK-wide deals for the sec whole sector right across the UK? I indeed. Um, again, it's important to emphasise they're, they're proposed by the sector. They're not yep. proposed by the UK government. They're proposed by the sector. And so where sectors uh, are, operate across the UK, uh, then uh, for... Uh, for obvious reasons, you, you would uh, expect them to, to represent every part of the UK, uh, and in so doing, uh, I would hope that they would, uh, they would bring together uh, policymakers, both at the, 
uh, the Scottish Government level and locally where there are particular clusters. Uh, obviously, if we're thinking of uh, oil and gas, um, where a sector deal, uh, I hope and expect, will be negotiated, Aberdeen um, will be, and the North East will be prominent uh, in that. Uh, so, uh, so that is, it is for, the, is for the sector to propose, but in scrutinising them, um, you know, one of the, the questions you would uh, ask is, is this, does this reflect the, the real footprint of the industry and are there any gaps? And, uh, and I would agree with you that in, uh, in uh, industries, in sectors uh, where there is uh, a very important Scottish uh, dimension, I would want to see that uh, very fully represented. So if the onshore wind industry <coughs> came forward and addressed these questions, you would consider a sector deal? So we, we've said that there's, uh, any sector can propose a, uh, a sector a deal. The model that we've taken is, I mentioned that um, I came up with the idea of city deals um, uh, several years ago now. Uh, and one of the features of city deals was this was not a kind of uniform requirement for every city in England as it, uh, as it started uh, to, to have a city deal. Uh, it was an invitation. It said, you know, if there are things that a, a city would like to do in a different way uh, and has ideas uh, of their own, we are up for uh, talking about and agreeing uh, a way forward on that. But there is no compulsion, there's no uh, requirement that every city has to have one uh, at all or at the same time. And so that approach uh, is the same with sectors. You know, by all means, you know, come together as a sector, think about what the opportunities are, whether it's in uh, research and development, whether it's in training, whether it's exporting. And if you've got really good ideas and you can show that it would benefit from uh, a good established connection with government, uh, we're up for that conversation. But there's no, uh, there's no requirement, there's no compulsion, and there's no, uh, there's no kind of window by which they have to, uh, to achieve it. Okay, finally, convener, just one brief question on a different topic. Um, uh, Scottish Limited Partnerships have been implicated in widespread criminality around the world. Government's made some announcements about um, tightening up the regulations on this. Um, can you confirm that you continue to be committed to doing that? Uh, I can confirm that. We'll be bringing uh, forward uh, proposals uh, on that. They are they're under... Uh, they're under consideration, under development, but it is something that's, that I recognise uh, we, uh, we will respond uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the investigations and the consultation that's taking place on that. Okay, thank you. We'll now come to Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I wonder whether I could take you to procurement, because mm. um, I think there's an increasing desire that's shared to maximise public investment in our economy by anchoring a lot of that in the country and also indeed in the supply chain. Now, SMEs make up the largest part of the Scottish economy, certainly, and some experience barriers to participation. Is there anything that you suggest in your industrial strategy or otherwise that would attempt to kind of remove those barriers? Yes, and very uh, good and important point. So one thing that we've done is we've changed the procurement rules to allow a greater consideration of local and social uh, impact, uh, for example, which was a... Uh, a change uh, from uh, what had taken place uh, uh, until then. Uh, but we recognize, as with uh, some the, the discussion we had about exporting, uh, that there are challenges uh, for small businesses to, uh, to navigate uh, some of the established processes that bigger businesses are either used to uh, or have enough uh, central resource uh, to be able to, uh, to to, to deal with. So we have a, uh, a big uh, commitment uh, in government but beyond because it applies to, to big contractors as well, big OEMs uh, as well, that they should open up their contracting to simplify it as much as, uh, as possible uh, and to enable SMEs uh, to participate in that. And that is uh, something that is part of bringing into greater prosperity, some businesses that have the potential but have been uh, frustrated in their ability to realise it. 
Sure. Let, let me open up the, the whole question of social impact, but also economic mm. impact, um, and uh, reference specifically shipbuilding. Mm. Now, I will wade through your industrial strategy. I didn't find a reference to shipbuilding, but I'm, I'm sure I will. But you appreciate the significance to the Scottish economy. Um, there has been a very recent decision, I think yesterday, in fact, um, by the MOD to put a £1 billion um, shipping contract out to international competition. Now, do you agree that actually it might be better to tender just within the UK so that we retain the suggested up to 10,000 jobs that would be created by the awarding of this public contract? Because it's one billion of, of our money that I would rather see, um, as I'm sure you would, spent in the United Kingdom, indeed in Scotland, um, rather than overseas. Well, uh, as I say, in our procurement, uh, the changes we've made to procurement, we uh, are able, in a way that we weren't uh, in the past, to take into account uh, some of the, uh, the social uh, impact. That is the, the right thing. Uh, we do uh, engage in competitive uh, procurement. That is important for value for money uh, for the, the taxpayer. That is uh, uh, clearly uh, important. Uh, and we also benefit as a, uh, as a country, and, uh, uh, and Scotland as every part of the, the UK, benefits from winning orders uh, from, uh, from other uh, uh, procurers of, uh, uh, of defence uh, equipment. So it's important that we uh, continue to be uh, able to, uh, to win bids uh, from other uh, countries. When it comes to the, uh, to the letting uh, and the management of this particular tender, uh, that really is a matter for uh, my colleagues in the Ministry of Defence, and they, uh, uh, you know, these are uh, obviously matters of, of great importance, and I think it would be wrong for me to uh, intrude on, uh, on their very let, important responsibilities. Let me invite you to intrude, because <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you've got an industrial strategy that is the expression of the whole of the UK government's position on growing the economy, um, and yet you have a department of government with big spending power looking overseas to invite companies that will actually receive state aid to bid against UK companies. Surely you could get the degree of competition you require within the UK because there's more than one shipbuilding yard. Well, part of our industrial strategy uh, is to be very clear that our economy and our society uh, prospers when it is part uh, of an international uh, free trading world in which we can export. We have a lot of our discussions were about how we can export better. Mm -hmm. uh, I think to, uh, to maintain, in fact, to increase our ability to export around the world uh, is a very important feature of our economy that it is, uh, that reputation uh, must continue. Uh, it's also important that we should have uh, competition, <coughs> not just uh, because of uh, the, the taxpayer's interest in securing value for money, but actually competition uh, can be an important driver of uh, innovation uh, and that you should always be able to make sure that you get the best product that's available. So these are very important values uh, of the, uh, the economic uh, environment that we have uh, and it's important uh, to promote them. What the industrial strategy does very deliberately, and it is a unashamedly activist uh, industrial strategy, is that it, uh, it, it addresses uh, many, if not all, of the factors that can contribute to us being successful there. So in research and development, the research and development activities that take place in the defence sector uh, are amongst the most important uh, in the economy. Uh, we're spending more uh, on R&D, that helps uh, our uh, domestic suppliers be more innovative uh, and be more competitive. The labour force uh, is crucial in here, uh, making sure that we have uh, a labour force uh, that is trained in the skills that they need uh, in the future is going to be very important when it comes to, uh, uh, to the tenders, both in this country uh, and around the world. Uh, making sure that we have the right supporting infrastructure, including you know, the, the attachment to place, which is, I think, unique in this industrial strategy compared to previous uh, uh, policy approaches uh, from a su successive business departments looks at making sure, uh, for example, that particular places, clusters of excellence are supported. So you've got a very vigorous and very activist uh, contribution uh, to UK industry uh, winning orders, but that has to be put in the context 
uh, of us being uh, one of the, uh, the leading nations in the world that persuades others to reduce their their barriers to allow us to export, and we have nothing to fear from that. And in fact, both the, Sc the Scottish economy and the UK uh, economy more widely, uh, I think, will prosper more the more markets we can enter. Um, convener, I will finish on this point, but, but um, I love your explanation of the industrial strategy, the clusters of excellence. I consider shipbuilding in Scotland to be one of them. The test, in my view, of whether your industrial strategy will meet the mark is whether this contract for shipbuilding remains in the UK or not. Well, on, because at the end of the day, it's £1 billion of our money, um, it's 10,000 jobs, um, that surely must count for something. So I do look forward to you going, beating a path to your colleague at the MOD to convince him of the error of his ways. I, I should just put on record that shipbuilding, I do recognise, is a very important uh, industry. I think it is a feature in the industrial strategy. I can't remember offhand which page uh, uh, it is. Uh, but we've had a review of, uh, of shipbuilding that's been conducted uh -huh. by the uh, MOD. So it is, uh, there is a very deliberate focus being placed uh, on it because, again, it's my view, you can work with industries uh, to, uh, uh, to enhance their competitiveness, and that's my commitment. Well, uh, perhaps we can all review our glossy copies of the industrial <laughs> strategy and see if we find the shipbuilding entry. Um, I'll come finally to Jamie Halcrow-Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Good morning. Secretary of State. Um, just going back to the energy side and renewables, mm. um, as a Highlands Islands MSP, somebody from Orkney, I recognise the importance of the remote island onshore wind, and, um, uh, but obviously to take advantage of that opportunity, the connectivity, the infrastructure has to be in place. Yep. So I don't know if you've got any update uh, on that. Can I also ask in terms of marine renewables, you'll be aware that the European Marine Energy yeah. Centre, EMEC on Orkney, is a world-leading uh, marine test centre. Um, but obviously those, that kind of centre requires support uh, to both attract business and development. Um, how will the UK government uh, support that going forward? Uh, it does, and uh, Mr Harker Johnson, I'm grateful for the, for the question. When we, when we had our, uh, our meeting, Orkney was uh, represented, as you, as you might uh, expect, um, and uh, having got the state aid uh, approval, uh, obviously our intention now is to, to make available um, the... Uh, the, the, the funding uh, pot uh, for remote island uh, wind. And, uh, and then, it, of course, it requires the connections to, uh, to follow, uh, but that comes as a, as a logical uh, consequence uh, of that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm very uh, interested and committed to new uh, technologies, uh, especially in renewables. Uh, tidal, given the, the coastline that we... Uh, we have, again, uh, around the UK, but, um, but Scotland has more than its uh, fair share of our, of our coastline, uh, has particular advantages there. Uh, I'm hoping to, uh, to visit EMEC in, uh, in Orkney uh, uh, when I get the chance to, to do so, to see for myself uh, what is being done there. One of the things that we've uh, done is to establish, uh, as part of the industrial strategy, an energy innovation uh, fund. Uh, that is available for technologies that may not be at the point that they're competitive in kind of pure uh, market terms, uh, but with, a, with more investment in research and development can be brought up to the level that they can be competitive. And, um, uh, and obviously, uh, marine is, is one of those uh, that falls into that category. I certainly hope you are able to, uh, to, to, to visit Orkney and Neil Kermode, I'm sure, would be delighted to welcome there. And, he's had, he, and within the sector, actually, in Orkney, has a huge amount of uh, expertise. And I think, you know, this is an area that where, uh, you know, uh, kind of innovation tested in Scotland can be, uh, be uh, commercialised across the whole of the, whole of the world. So, um, so that would be excellent. Thank you. Well, I think that... Uh more or less concludes our time. We have very limited time this morning, unfortunately, due to chamber business commencing at 20, um, 20 to 12, I think. So therefore, we uh, need to conclude uh, our discussions subsequent to this session. So uh, thank you very much, Secretary of State, for coming in today, and also Jenny Bates. And uh, I'll suspend the session, and we'll move into private session now. Thank but you. Can I say, um, uh, convener and, and colleagues, it's been a great pleasure to be to be here. I've enjoyed the uh, the questions and the discussion. There's some points to follow up on, uh, and if the committee is interested, it would. This I talked about a long-term strategy. I think a long-term 
uh, and sustained engagement would be uh, of great interest to, to me and my colleagues if the committee could bear to, uh, to see us again in a few months' time. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'll suspend the session now.